During university, we're trained in a lot of things. We're trained how to do calculations, check deflection, do shear strength, do flexure checks, making sure the connection design is correct. But quite often, we're not taught one of the most important things that we all need to know, whether you're just starting out later on, but also be the biggest boost to your career. And that is understanding and documenting drawings. You may be saying, why do I need drawings? Don't I just need calculations? That's not the case. Your drawings are the one thing that client sees. That's your output of what the client sees you do and makes every job either harder or easier. A well-documented set of drawings will make a project so much easier. Doesn't matter how good the engineering is. Let's break down what the structural drawings are, some of the key things to look out for and how to become a better engineer. So what makes structural drawings different to any other diagram? They're more than just a diagram. They're showing you how a building gets put together, what the final state is, sometimes documenting even temporary states, but it's really trying to document your design intent. There's many buildups of drawings that you need to look out for. General arrangement plans, you might have separate reinforcement plans, framing plans, but these are all typically top down. Then you can look at elevations, which are side on, looking at a building, or see how the elevation of the building goes together, and then potentially even section cuts that are sections through the whole building showing every single floor. Now they're just the general arrangement of the drawings. And moving up a little bit more, sometimes you might have little call outs on drawings, which will have a little box around a certain area on your drawing, a little call out out to the side that will say, this is now a more detailed blown up area as there's a lot of detail in here that I need to show. In addition to call outs, you can also have section cuts that are cutting through a specific part of the building that needs to have more detail to show your design intent. So you need to make sure that you have enough drawings in both the plans, sections, elevations. And when you're looking at the plans, there's something key to watch out for. There's normally a key nomenclature that you may not have heard about. And this is about either solid lines, dashed lines. So what do they mean? A solid line is typically you looking down and you can see the step in the drawing. So you're seeing the step or fold from above the slab. Where if you're looking down and you potentially can't see it, if you need x-ray vision to see that, you'll see a dash line that will show anything below the structure. So whether that be a top flange of a steel beam and you can see the web member, the dash lines means that something's hidden from view or is typically called a hidden line. Meaning there's a softer fold below the line that's key for you understanding where you are. On those plans as well, you need to have enough information with key references so people can call up specific areas like A1. And also enough information that if you're either looking at the architect drawings or other people's drawings, there's enough keys to work out where you are. So whether you're on site, you're trying to work out, okay, I can see a column there, there and there, I can work out where I am. If I'm looking at architectural drawings, seeing where the walls are or MEP drawings. So there is enough information there that you're both referencing where you are and where the drawings need to be. So every symbol, call out and line on that drawing is really important. You don't want to make sure that you're adding too many lines as it can get very confusing. If it gets too cluttered, potentially splitting different things into different plans, clear layout of how you're doing. So typically what I would like to do is go from top down. So I'll typically have top reinforcement, stirrups, and then bottom reinforcement. Although it's typically built the other way around, it means that you can either go towards backwards or backwards and forwards to put the structure together. The other one too is typically having a legend off to the side. So if you're unsure what something is, typically you'll need to read the legend off to the side. They'll give clarity about what's on your drawings because not everyone documents in the exact same way. Having a clear legend about how your documentation should be read is really helpful. It makes it more clear about what things actually mean. Even things like typical little codes like N16-200EW. What does that mean? Well, I know what that means, but potentially breaking it down on the drawings. For those who don't, that's an N16 at 200 centers each way. And you might even have TMB at the bottom, which also means top and bottom. So it means N16s, 200 each way, top and bottom. So having these little codes, you can make it clear about what is intended. Because if they're hard or unclear what to read, they potentially won't get built, skipped, or potentially lead to costly delays in your projects. And a lot of time people, especially nowadays, will overlook big bodies of text. And what do you typically see in the start of a lot of structural drawings? These are big bodies of text. They're not just those fine print clauses that you overlook and tick and move on. They're generally documenting what structure should be put together. What are some of the codes and standards that need to be there? Is there some centers, spacing, concrete grades? Is there any ground prep? Is there any material preps that you need to do to any of the steel structure, especially in specialized conditions. Any other generalized notes to make sure that the construction is built up to code. It's not just something to overlook or just to put on any drawing. 
So when you're putting those general notes in, you also want to make sure they're relevant to every project as if you just put every single note in, people just ignore them and move on. Where if you make sure they're highly relevant for the project that you're working on, they will become a lot more efficient. For example, you don't want to have steel notes on a structure that's all concrete or concrete notes in a structure that's all steel or vice versa or timber or any of those other ones. And you do want to make sure that you read through them as little mistakes can fall in. I remember one of my first projects that I was working on, we had some general notes that we used on many projects. It wasn't until one time a builder question that said, have you actually read these? And to be fair, I hadn't at the time and that was probably my mistake. But there was a little note that was missing on there when instead of being snug time, which is a way that you meant to tighten up a bolt to a certain length, it's actually a technical term, it said sunk time. So I had this hilarious image in my face of these builders singing towards their bolts as they're trying to do them up. So luckily we fixed that and a lot of people took it for the intent that was meaning to. But it's something that you shouldn't overlook that you should make sure that you're checking to make sure that they're relevant and also up to date and also none of these funny spelling mistakes that could lead to disaster if not correctly managed. And structural drawings just aren't standalone documents. You need to make sure that you're coordinated to architectural drawings and they're matching. You don't want to have two sets of drawings coming there with different levels of documentation or different versions. You might be working on version one with architects working on version five, which is a completely different design. It can lead to disaster results, potentially building the wrong building or the wrong parts in the wrong locations. I want to make sure that you're coordinating with MEP. There's no building is just all structural. You need lights, you need air conditioning, you need ventilation. You need to make sure that you have drainage. So you need to make sure you're accommodating for all those things in your design and both the structure and the MEP and other parts are cross-coordinated to lead to the correct results. So slight miscommunications or coordinations can lead to projects to slow down greatly. At the start, it may feel like a little bit of a pain, but the later you leave it, the harder it is to fix. And the more costly it will be to fix when it comes to site, as the builder is potentially trying to build something and go, hmm, that pipe can't go through that wall. So how do we fix that? You'll get a call up, we need to look at rectification works, potentially even you or your company will need to pay for those if it's something that was missed or overlooked. There'll be calls to both the MEP, the architect, yourself. So a lot of people will be burning a lot of time to work out how to deal with these results. So what a time, what you want to be doing is constantly laying over the architectural drawings on your drawings, overlaying the MEP on your drawings as well, potentially even having ways that you can just turn on on off layers to make sure that they're currently matching with the current documentation. If you're doing it in 3D, there is ways to pass information between each other using corrective layers so that you can see what has changed and what hasn't. And in bigger projects, there's even whole divisions that help this coordination. And in those big projects that can get extremely costly lead to huge cost blowouts that no one wants to have. So that's why it's always worth spending the time and cross coordinating with your other consultants. There's no building is all structured, no building is all MEP and no building is all architecture. Without the combination and symbiosis of all three is the only way to lead to a good design. In addition to doing better drawings, there's one thing that you need to know as structural engineers, and I have a link to a video here that will make your designs better, making you into a better, faster structural engineer. And if you do want to support the channel, there is two ways that you can do this. You can either become a YouTube or Patreon member. Without the support of my YouTube and Patreon members, this type of content will not be possible. As always, keep learning, and I hope to see you next time.